he started a bit of a spin on our series last week and he introduced this concept of a door, which we'll get to shortly. Um, but effectively, over the last two months, we've been dealing with uh, a very particular place and time in Scripture. And it's around the time of, of the Israelites' emergence out of the promised land, um, out of captivity. And then a lot of, the, a lot of the conversations we've been having is regarding their time in the wilderness. Um, but what we're trying to do now is, is, is look at, at, at the idea of, of what's going on in the promised land specifically. But if you are absolute novice <laughs> in terms of biblical uh, geography and history, um, we're going to do a short lesson on this just to orientate you here. So Phil's going to bring up a map. So I thought, let's start with the most obvious, where we are, you know. So we're down in South Africa down here, and this is Africa. If you don't know that, then you've definitely missed out on a lot of things in life. And um, so we've got Africa here, um, and this is kind of where uh, everything takes place. We're going to zoom in, in in a second there, but it's good to remind ourselves, uh, just as you look at this map, of the very specific uh, geographic and uh, historical context in which the Bible is written. Sometimes I have to remind myself, the Bible's not like reading Lord of the Rings or some other fantasy thing. These are real characters in, in, in actual history. These are real flesh and blood people having real experiences with God. Uh, this isn't just some mysticism and fantasy. This is a, a real deal. Let's um, specifically now... Um, the, the context uh, zooms into the northeast corner of Africa, and here's Egypt. And let's zoom in again, Phil. Um, and this is kind of where everything goes down, in this kind of area here. In particular, the promised land is up here on the right, uh, Israel. Now, this is all modern-day maps. This is literally just me screenshotting Google Maps um, and, and, and putting this up. So the guys were over there. Sorry for you guys at the back, by the way. I know you don't have the laser thing going on here. Um, the... The guys were over here in, in, in Egypt. They, the promised land was up here. This is the Sinai Desert. And this is where they spent those great 40 years wandering around. Uh, you can see it's quite a short trek, but, but they didn't quite get there. And they were wandering around quite a, a lot there. And that's where our story is concentrated up, up till now, kind of looking at the various lessons that are drawn out of that specific time and place in Israel's history. Now fast forward um, to uh, out of the wilderness, fast forward a few hundred years, and, and here these guys were now living in this promised land in the, in the nation of Israel or that God had promised them, and they're well established. But there's one very uh, specific thing that I want to point out. And although they had made it, and they had now families, and there's generations, and there's millions of people now in this land, they weren't necessarily living out the mandate that God had given them when he, when he gave them the promise in the wilderness. They weren't living it. As much as they were dwellers in the promised land, perhaps they weren't citizens of the way God wanted them to live. This to me is, is an absolute disaster. You read some of the stories about these guys, and particularly their leaders, sometimes it says, no thing had been done as bad as it's been done now than had been done ever before. And this is while they're in the promised land. <laughs> this is while they're there. This is hugely important and important for us because we've been progressing to the promised land. But sometimes in the promised land is that we're living like dwellers and not indeed like true citizens. We may have accepted salvation and accepted Jesus and we live under that promise, but we're not really living out our faith. Perhaps we're not experiencing God as He would have us. This, is a, this can be a potential disaster. And we're going to look at, at, at one man this morning who I believe did experience God, who was living in the promised land, and his name was Elijah. And Elijah had some remarkable encounters and experiences with God. But this, this series is all about the doors that God opens to you and I in the promised land. And that, that while, while we're living in the promised land, God opens doors that lead to greater and deeper and more rich experiences of Him. So th these are doorways into experiencing a, a relationship with God. And this is what the series is all about. And, and today specifically is that first, um, I want to hopefully get excited about, <laughs> about the fact that God wants us to experience Him. So that's my first objective and say, you know, this is a big deal. And the second one is to make it a bit practical. 
and make it very practical in a way that you and I can walk out of here today in confidence that you, we, can, we can experience this God of history, this God of this context, this God who spoke 3,000 years ago. So let's, um, let's uh, get ready to open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. Um, as you do that, I'm going to invite Leonie up. She's going to come in and do the reading for us this morning so you have a different voice. Um, as a precursor um, to this story, um, 1 Kings 19, Elijah as a precursor had been involved in perhaps one of the most um, um, remarkable dramatic victories in Scripture, this famous uh, scene on Mount Carmel where God comes down in fire and, 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 and he exposes how false um, the, the God Baal is, or Baal, I don't particularly know how to say this guy's name, and he exposes how false he is and embarrasses essentially King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, the then king and queen of Israel, and he then turns to execute these false prophets, 450 prophets, Elijah just nails with a sword, and we pick up then his story on the back of this great victory in 1 Kings Chapter 19, verses 1 to 13. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And that's where we'll stop it um, for now. Thanks, Leone. You are a machine reader. You're, we used to have soul group together, and every time you know you get that moment, who's going to read the Bible passage? It was always a no-brainer for us. Leone was was the person. Um, let's pick up um, on a couple of things out of this passage. This is a really, really cool passage and um, a really cool story, but let's just be- get our bearings here. Um, Phil, let's pull up that last map again. So here we are here. Um, now, now, Elijah was effectively up here towards Jerusalem, uh, around about that area. It mentioned Jezreel and Beersheba. They were kind of uh, towns near that area. And God God said, I want you to go down and I want you to take a journey down to Mount Horeb, also known in the Bible as Mount Sinai, which is kind of down right towards the southern kind of tip here. Um, They don't quite know. There's there's debate about where that is today, um, but it's somewhere down the the southern tip here, uh, down here. And and, um, so today what I did, if you pull up the next map, I I quickly plugged it into Google. And how long would it take me in a car to drive kind of roughly from that area down to kind of approximately where they think this place was. It's 506 k's down that this guy had to get on his... Well, he didn't actually get on anything. He, he walked. 506 k's. It would take 6 hours, 42 minutes today in a car. That's the equivalent of essentially driving to East London, you know, and, and that's how far it is. Um, uh, uh, it would be a long, long way to walk. If you had to walk, you'd have to follow the N2 around. You wouldn't even be able to go down the coastline straight away. That's kind of the length, if you kind of want to kind of get some bearings for the, 
the distances in this area, that's the length uh, that Elijah had to walk. But the last map then indicates how he did that in the, in the older kind of uh, area. So there he was, Jezreel, there's Jerusalem, there's Beersheba. And he heads down there to Mount Sinai at God's beckoning. And he takes this journey. And what happens at this mountain when he gets there are two remarkable things. Now first, uh, before we mention those two things, this is the same mountain, guys, as the Israelites came to uh, when, they, when they came out of Egypt and God met them there with the Ten Commandments. This is the same mountain when um, Moses was looking after sheep and he saw the burning bush and, and, and God met him there. There's something significant about this mountain, particularly in an Old Testament context. And, and what happens at this mountain is, is remarkable, remarkable, and we've just heard this story. The first thing that happens is that God asks him this question, and he asks him it twice, once before he's, um, oh, no, no, it's twice at the mountain. He asks this question, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Now, I don't know if God was maybe just messing with him a bit, because God obviously knew why he was there. Because God had actually told him to come there, but he still asked, what are you doing here? And when you look at Elijah's response, even beforehand, um, we look at Elijah's kind of state. He'd said earlier in the passage, Lord, take my life. <laughs> I'd rather die than kind of dwell with myself at the moment. I'm no, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. He says, I've had enough. Some of the other adjectives he uses, he's, he talks about how the Israelites have rejected and they've broken down the altars of God. And he says, I'm the only one left. I'm alone, in other words. He's describing his state to God. And, and kind of it, what, what I believe God is kind of asking him to do is kind of to answer the question, Elijah, how are you doing at this moment? Or perhaps, how is, your, how is your, the state of your heart? How is your relationship with me right now? How's the level of your faith? You know, um, there's a book called Not a Fan. And uh, Not a Fan, he talks about uh, this first uh, step of becoming a follower of Jesus is having a DTR conversation. Uh, it's a define the relationship conversation. It's when you get in that point for you guys who have been married years and you might remember this type of point. At one point in your life, you probably had to define the relationship with the person you were you know, having vibes with, as we like to say, or interested in. And you have to, for guys, or maybe it's girls, you have to kind of get to a point where you've got to express yourself, right? Like, I like you. <laughs> I don't know, what do, you, what do you say? It's unfair that, that the guy often has to initiate it. These days, it's, 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 it's actually hectic because all these oaks here in front, I tune them, but they just, uh, they just SMS it. Oh, you're really awesome. I really like you. It's so easy. But... A lot of you uh, slightly more mature people would have had to have the conversation. And you always get to that point where you've got to like define the relationship, you know, express what's going on between you and that girl. And I, had to, I remember I had to do that with Jess and I was, you know, not particularly manly. I had a pillow and I went, <laughs> she said, what? What do you want to You're going to have to say that again, Jason. I like you. Do you want to go out on a date? <laughs> and this is, these are defined the relationship moments. They can sometimes be awkward um, and fun. But this is essentially what's happening here. God is defining where him and Elijah now stand. And so let me ask you, how would you define your current relationship with God? What is your current experience with God. I've got a list of words that might help you out here. Um, I'm going to just step over here so I can see them. Uh, would you say it's non-existent, exciting, discouraging, or dynamic? Is it sinful, perhaps? Has it plateaued? Is it growing? Is it powerful, contagious, or embarrassing, maybe? Is it in decline? Is it miraculous? Are you bewildered? Are you hopeless? Is it deepening? Are you confused, victorious, defeated? Are you joyful? Are you ashamed? Do any of those jump out to you that maybe can help you articulate how you are currently experiencing God? That's a list that I drew from a book called Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby, and it is a good read um, that maybe um, we are using a little bit for the context of this sermon. And feel free to go buy that. They do have it at CUM Books. 
But he talks about this list here. If we're going to have genuine, uh, your desire to, to, with, is to have a genuine experience with God, it has to start at this place of honesty, transparency about your current state. Just like Elijah was saying. Elijah didn't mince his words. He literally wanted to die. <laughs> and that was his, his current state. Where, where are you at in your current state with God? Second thing that happens, the first thing is this, define the relationship moments, this, define the relationship conversation. The second thing that takes place is the way in which God does reveal himself to Moses, uh, to Elijah. Always getting these oaks confused. Uh, getting, he reveals himself to Elijah in an utterly remarkable way. And I pick up again uh, from, from in 1 Kings. It says, when Elijah goes to stand out on the mountain, a great and powerful wind comes. It tears up the rocks. Then a, a, um, an earthquake comes, and, it's, and it just shakes everything, and then a fire comes. But in each one of those, in each one of these powerful uh, moods of nature, God, it says, is not in them. And then afterwards comes a small, gentle whisper, and God is found in that whisper saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? And I want to contend that this moment in history, in my experience and in reading Scripture, although God does speak in, in many ways, I found that often, often the voice of God is found in small, gentle whispers and promptings. And I don't want to limit God's interaction in any way. I wouldn't want to do that. But it's often a whisper. And for us to hear that whisper, in a sense, we're going to have to be like Elijah. We've got to be positioned in the right place. So Elijah was obedient to going down to the mountain. And then when we're there, we've got to be listening. <laughs> we can't just be expecting um, you know, God to kind of show up in a, in a fire. It's often li- listening intensely. Now, this idea of, of hearing God in the context of Elijah at a specific time, at a specific place, is something that I can relate to in my own life. I, I took a mission trip uh, with our church growing up and as I kind of was getting serious about my relationship with God, they used to go on mission trips, and I thought, oh, I want to go on a mission trip too. This is going to be cool. And our church went to Swaziland, and I went along to Swaziland, and we did all sorts of stuff. And I remember waking up one morning, and I was up, and I decided I'm just going to go for a walk around the field next to where we were staying at someone's house. So I just walked around the field. When all of a sudden, walking there, I was totally overwhelmed just with the presence of God. I didn't have a Bible in my hand. I didn't, uh, I actually wasn't necessarily going to have a quiet time. I just went for a walk. And unexpectedly, in that particular place, at that particular geographic location, God came and, I, and, and it was in the form of a whisper. And I was overwhelmed to the point of tears as I, I knew God was saying to me, I'm here with you right now and I've, gonna, I've got a plan for your life that I'm going to unfold with you. And I had to go to my youth pastor, like, drizzling like a baby, but I didn't even know why, because I hadn't, nothing had happened. And I said, I don't know. And he just said to me, God is speaking to you. Just be open and keep listening. And I relate to this, this experience of Elijah. Uh, these are, in a sense, maybe you can too. These are the Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai experiences. But here's what I want to say in relation to Elijah's specific experience here is that characteristically, this way of experience God tends to be an, an Old Testament way of experience God. You see, the idea of going to a sacred place, they used to go up, it says the Israelites, to the temple to worship in Jerusalem, going to the mountain of God, those are char- characteristically Old Testament principles. And I want to make a fundamental turn here in, in the context of this sermon today, a fundamental switch um, and look at, at how the New Testament uh, talks about experiencing God and the difference that we have with it. And, and uh, we're going to look quickly at John chapter 4, um, uh, verse 19 to 24. It will be on the screen if you don't have your Bibles again. John chapter 4, verse 19 to 24, it says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. This now is Jesus, by the way. He's on the road to Galilee with his disciples. So this is the context, and he stops for a well, and he, at a well, and he has this conversation here with this Samaritan woman. So she says, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers 
worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. All right, two significant places of worship that she's referring to. And for her, who's a Samaritan, the mountain she's talking about is not necessarily um, Mount Sinai that we've been talking about. She's talking about another mountain where the Samaritans believe that that was where Abraham sacrificed his son Isaac. For them, it was a holy place, a place of worship, as was Jerusalem for the Jews. Verse 21, Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth in truth. Jesus is saying, a time is coming, a time is coming, a time is coming that something is going to happen and something is going to change. And, he, and I can sense his excitement as he's building this woman to this climax. And, and he's saying, there's something significant going on here and it's a fundamental change that's going to happen. There's fundamental change related to experiencing God. That he's starting to underplay the, the mountain uh, uh, experience and the temple experience at Jerusalem. And he's saying the time is coming. And indeed, he says, the time has now come. The time has now come. What exactly has come? <laughs> what is this time? And here's the time that has come. Is that you and I don't have to trek 500 k's through the desert to have an experience of God. We don't have to do that anymore. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with maybe perhaps uh, more um, memorable, tangible times where we've sensed God's presence in specific moments at specific locations. But for the Israeli nation, this is groundbreaking and it's absolutely earth-shattering and it strikes right at the heart of how they regard uh, a relational experience with God. In a sense, it opens up this door to a whole new experience with God. That the door to the mountain, the door to the mountain of experience, God, has now been brought closer to them. That they don't have to trek down to the temple or, or to the mountain, but that door they can walk through on a more regular basis. I try to understand how significant this was to them, and, and a maybe, maybe more modern example of it. If you um, had to take, for example, a, a, a relationship that was started without ever seeing a person. So this is now a cyber relationship. And now these days it's actually quite common. But let's say you started a relationship with someone in Poland. And you met this Polish girl online. And you, you, you fall in love with her somehow, even though you're not with her. Uh, but you, you talk through Skype. Skype is like a program. If you don't know what it is, you can see the other person on the other side of the world, their face. And you have this Skype relationship, and you, and, you, and you fall in love with them, and you talk to them about all this going on. And then you decide, let's get married. Let's get married. So you marry this Polish girl on the other side of the world, but of course, it's not in person. You're doing it over Skype. And you have the Skype wedding, and it's great, and <laughs> sort of. And um, you, you, you have the Skype wedding and the Skype marriage, and then... And you keep building your relationship with that. And then five years goes by and it's, it's great, but you know, you kind of f feel like you're missing something, right? Ten years goes by and, then, and you're still used to the Skype thing. But then one day, after 15 years, your wife says, I'm coming. The time has come. <laughs> I'm coming to you, baby. I am moving over to be with you in person all the time. I'm going to be next to you. I'm going to be right with you. I'm going to be walking with you and driving with you and living life with you and, you know, doing all the other marriage stuff together. And this is the significance of what Jesus was saying to this woman, is that they would have a new experience with God because of what Jesus was ushering in. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Some of us, we still live our Christian lives in a, in a sense, kind of like the Old Testament way of relating to God. We want to go to somewhere to experience God. We, we maybe go to church, and that's our experience of God. Awesome to go to church. And I guarantee you, if you come here week in and week out, you'll experience God. But if your faith is based solely on that, there's a problem. Going to, going to events or to conferences 
uh, uh, which just strengthen your faith, faith, but just leaving it there, it's the same thing as just being a dweller in the promised land, but not truly a citizen of how God would have you live. And in doing so, we are completely missing out on the rich and rewarding experience of being able to enter through the mountain door to, to experiencing God on the mountain. We, we miss that. We miss the everyday potential experience when we practice our faith like this. Jess tells me uh, one of her spiritual superheroes is a guy called Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> That's a superhero name just on its own, Wigglesworth. And uh, anyway, he was an incredible man of faith in the 18 and 1900s, a very ordinary man, but who God gifted with extraordinary gifts, uh, particularly those for healing and deliverance. And he was known to raise many people from the dead. And Jess told me about this one time, someone interviewed him and uh, interviewed Smith Wigglesworth and said, hey, Smith, tell me, what is the secret of your power? And he paused and thought about it for a second. And he said, the secret of my power is one word, plodding, plodding. Now that, that is almost a, a boring take in a sense on, on the excitement of the Christian faith. But let me tell you, that is actually fantastic insight into wisdom, into, into a truth about our faith, because it's actually, it's actually paralleling the language of what the New Testament talks about experiencing God. And today we've been talking quite a lot about the Old Testament and how Elijah went to have this experience with God in the form of a gentle whisper. But I want to look at the New Testament and the ways in which God is uh, whispering to us in the context of New Testament language. And I think these might perhaps help you and I practically experience God in our life. Um, Luke 9 verse 23 is our first one. Luke 9 verse 23 should come up on the screen. Jesus says to the disciples, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take their cross, take up their cross daily and follow me daily. The first word the New Testament points out to an experience with God is the word daily. Our experience of God starts with a fundamental choice. Are we going to do it every day or are we not? In the context of relationship, you know when you have like an issue with someone and, and maybe the issue is with them, but it's not with you. So you're like, no, it's you. It's not me. You know, it's, it's you. It's not me. Uh, but maybe the issue is with you. You're like, no, 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 I need to break up. It's, it's me. It's not you. No, no, I, it's, it's me. It's me, not you. No, 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 it's not you. It's me. You know, one of those type of conversations. In this case, it's me, not God. <laughs> it's us, not God. You see, God has done his part. God has taken the first step, and God has chosen that daily he will be with us. Have you chosen that daily... You want to be with God. The Bible says, remember, that God first loved us. He's taken the step. It's not Him. It's us. It's us. And, and it starts with this choice, as Jesus says. The New Testament language starts with this. It's every day. It's not, it's not yeah, every day. Second, Galatians chapter 5, uh, uh, verse 16 and then 22 to 25. It says, Next one, Phil, the verse. All right, let's look it up here. Oh, here we go. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is exactly what Smith Wigglesworth was saying. Smith Wigglesworth was saying, the secret to my faith is plodding. It's taking steps every single day in an intentional direction when I don't feel like it, when I'm tired, when I'm weary. And the, 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 the language of the New Testament in Galatians says it's in step. It's walking in step with God. Some of my favorite moments, even in my own relationship with Jess, um, have to do with exactly this. You know, car trips together in, in places around the country or whatever. 
where you're sharing uh, experiences and you're talking about random stuff and, and you're busy, you know, enjoying the scenery. This is how God wants us to live with Him, in step with Him every day. And it's obedience aspect that as we do this and as we're starting to walk in step with Him and walking, um, when we leave here, we're walking with Him and when we wake up tomorrow, guess what? We're still walking with Him and when we, when we go to work, we're walking with Him. We start to find that we become more like Him, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things, they start to come out of us in these ways which we didn't know was possible. That every day an in-step life is what God wants from us. Smith Wigglesworth called this life, uh, this way of doing things, the secret place. Listen to what he says here. He says, oh, to dwell in the secret place, his presence. What will this presence do? It will dare us to believe all God says, assisting us to lay hold of the promises. We will have, some, we will have God so indwelling us that we will become a force, a power of God's abiding until the time death is swallowed up in victory. The secret place is what God is beckoning us to. The final word that, that comes out uh, of the New Testament, of a New Testament kind of language of experiencing God, is found in uh, John chapter 15, um, verses 5 to 9, and then we'll look at verse 15. It says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain on me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Then he goes on to say, as, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead... I have called you friend. For everything that I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. The final word in this, in this translation says remain. Another word in English which they use is abide. That God wants us to remain in Him. This is a, it's a state of quality. He defines the, the everyday in-step thing. He defines the quality of it for us here. And he uses the word friends. <laughs> now this is absolutely amazing. Is that we have a quality of friendship with Christ that is, is ours for the taking. It's the door of experiencing, the door that Elijah walked through into the mountain. That door has now been brought into our own homes. That we can walk through that every single day and be able to experience God's gentle whispers every day as we stay in step with Him, and as we practice this friendship with Him, is the relationship of the highest kind that the God of the universe would consider us His friend. Listen again to what Smith Wigglesworth says. How can I get established faith, you ask? He says, abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Don't change your position, but always have the presence of God, the glory of God, Pay any price to, buy, to abide under that covering. For the secret of victory is to abide where the victor abides. Pay any price to remain in that friendship with God. And because Smith Wigglesworth recognized how beautiful that was. And for us too, the experience of God is found in, is, as the New Testament prescribes. Every day living in step and staying remaining, abiding in that friendship. Okay, we're going to finish. Right at the beginning I said, the one thing I, I, I hope to do today is, is encourage you that a deeper experience with God is possible. But I also wanted to give you something practical um, that, uh, that through the New Testament we can actually realize that God is directing us to this. And... Um, as we close today, um, I want to make this very, very, very practical. And um, I want to I wanna challenge you with something. Now, we are in August here, and it's, 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 the, middle, uh, it's the beginning of August. And um, August 1st is, what, yesterday, I believe. <laughs> Somewhere there. And, um, okay, August 1st was yesterday. 
And, and, and I want to give you a challenge for the month of August to put this kind of thing to the test, to, to put it to practice. Um, I, I talked about this to, to, youth, uh, to our youth guys on Friday night, and I said to them, I want to challenge you to, to experience God. Because I believe what I said. I believe that God uh, can be experienced on an everyday basis. So here's what I said to them. I said, there's 31 days in August. The book of John has 21 chapters. And I want to encourage you to consider reading a chapter of John every single day. You see, I believe that when we, when we, um, when we want to experience God, God is so found readily in His Word. And when we regularly attend to His, His Word, um, we'll be able to find Him. And this is, this is something I believe so much. In a sense, it's kind of like a money-back guarantee. And I remember this clearly, um, the power of God's Word in terms of experiencing God. I had one of our youth guys come visit me once. And um, I hadn't hardly known him, but he came in and he said, he said this to me. He said, Jason, why do, you, why do you love so much? And I said, hold on a second. First of all, I hardly even know you. I don't love you that much because I don't even know you. you know? Secondly, I work for a church. It's my job to love you. you know? Don't put that on me. But I said to him, look, I, I do it because of what Jesus tells me to do in Scripture. And I opened to him 1 John. And it's a fantastic uh, 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 description of how God loves us in 1 John. And I started to read some of the words. I said, God is love. And as I started to read the words about how God loves us, he just started crying. And I was reading and I looked up and I just saw the tears drizzling down this guy's face. And I realized that the power of Scripture is totally understated today. That when we commit ourselves regularly and investing time into His Word, transformation happens. And you might be sitting here going, man, I, I battle with experiencing God. My experiencing God is maybe not so good. Guys, I want to challenge you during the month of August to commit yourself to reading the Word of God every day. And I, almost, I gave our youth guys a bit of a break. I said, there's 21 chapters of John. Uh, you've got 31 days, which means you can have Saturdays off and Sundays you can come to church. But Monday till Friday, John chapter 1, Monday, tomorrow morning, John chapter 2. John chapter 3, Wednesday. John chapter 4, Thursday. John chapter 5, Friday. If you get to the month of August, I'd love to hear what God does. Because I guarantee you, if you do this, God will speak. And God will speak and you'll experience God in a way perhaps that you haven't had before as you daily choose to step into the mountain of experience with Him and abiding in relationship with Him. My grandfather, um, who's become a writer in his recent times, prayed this. He says, Heavenly Father, may the quiet time with you be the finest moments we spend each day. May the quiet time with you may the, be the finest moments we spend each day. Let's pray. God, I just thank you that you have opened the door to experiencing you. God, I thank you that we don't have to trek 500 Ks to a sacred mountain anymore to find you, Lord. But God, through your Son, Jesus, and now by your Spirit, we can walk in step with you. And so I pray this prayer again, Lord. May the quiet times we spend with you, may they be the finest moments of our day. Oh God, I just pray during this month of August, God, won't you speak? Lord, you, you promise in your word that when we seek you, we will find you. And I just really ask that you would fulfill that promise now as we undertake to committing ourselves to walking through the mountain door every day. God, I just pray as, as people uh, and us in this congregation do this, Lord, that we would find you, Lord. Oh God, speak, we ask, for, for, for our, our very livelihood depends on hearing from you, Lord. May you speak by your word in a special way this month, Lord. In our lives and in our church, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.